Minister for Women. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister convene a cross-party drought cabinet to ensure that representatives from across the parliament work together constructively to respond to the drought emergency in the interests of farmers and rural communities? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for the question. The government's drought response over a year ago was based on the multi-party, multi-organisation drought summit that was convened in the old parliament house, of course, which the, uh, the opposition was invited to attend, as were all states and territories, as was the National Farmers Federation, the many different agricultural producer groups, a charitable organisation, the Country Women's Association, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, experts uh, f and officials from across government agencies and departments. And Mr. Speaker, yes, the drought the drought coordinator was in attendance there, member Mr Speaker, as, I, as the interjection from the member for Hunter uh, indicates, and he was actually uh, central to the organisation of that drought summit. And Mr Speaker, all of, there were many members from this House who were present at that summit as well, and that summit um, framed the drought response the government has continued to roll out since that time. And since that time, we have con continued to listen very carefully, particularly through the Minister for Drought, uh, to rural communities across the country to ensure that the response that we are continuing to provide is up to the mark in terms of the needs in rural and regional communities across Australia. And I remind the House that that response has three components. The first of those components is to ensure the direct financial support and assistance, as is the responsibilities of the Commonwealth, under the National Drought Agreement. Uh, which was revised and updated after that drought summit, which made it very clear that it was the Commonwealth's responsibility to, to look after uh, the uh, income support and other financial assistance to farm households and, their, and those communities, and issues such as fodder subsidies and freight subsidies and the direct care of animals and others um, involved in the welfare of the farms themselves. That was the responsibility of the states and territories. And so the reforms we've made to farm household allowance alone means that at a period over just over four years, with the announcement we made last week that individual farm households would have received as couples $125,000 in direct financial support, not alone, but direct financial support over and above, Mr. Speaker, what they are able to do in terms of earning off-farm income, which we lifted the threshold up to $100,000, $100,000 in off-farm income. Uh, and that enables them, even with that off-farm income, to access that farm household allowance. Now, there was the support to drought-affected communities through the Drought Communities Program. So it's not just about the farmers and graziers specifically; it's also about the communities that are affected. And we've invested in over 120 councils and their shire areas to ensure that we're supporting the continuation and growth of their economies during difficult times. And of course, we've invested in water resilience. That's our plan. We're getting on with it, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to get on with it, listening to farming communities, Mr. Speaker. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain plan is addressing the challenges facing our nation. Is the Prime Minister aware of how different approaches would weaken our ability to meet these challenges? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank <coughs> pardon me, the member for Robertson for her question. At the last election, Australians wanted to be able to plan for their future with confidence in what they knew would be uncertain global times and at times domestically where there are many pressures. Uh, on Australia, no, no less so, of course, than the drought itself, but the many other pressures that families face around the country. And so they elected a government that they knew would be able to address these very difficult circumstances with stability, with certainty, with measure, and do so in a way not, 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 not afflicted by the politics of crisis or, or the policies of crisis, but with the stable and calm approach that enables them to get on and plan for their future with confidence. And that's why, Mr Speaker, as a government, we are continuing to do that, whether it is maintaining the discipline in our budget management, which is one of the reasons why, the big reason why, we've been able to take what was an absolute 
fiscal wreckage that was left to us under the Labor Party. And over the last six years, we have painstakingly done the work, getting expenditure under control, making the choices that are necessary to get the budget back into a position that exactly. gives this country resilience at a time when exactly it needs right. it. Exactly resilience right. at a time when it needs it, not just to deal with today, as we are when it comes to our record funding for hospitals and schools and funding fully the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Mr Speaker, and all of these programs, mental health, additional support, but to ensure that for the future, as we move to 2 per cent of GDP and defence uh, force funding uh, as a result of the reforms we've put in place as the government, we're providing for the future as well. $100 billion in an infrastructure pipeline, new water infrastructure, 21 projects which are around the country today, Mr Speaker, some $1.5 billion being invested in those projects, many of which are under the way even today. And it's been that stable and that certain and that calm approach that Australians have been looking for, whether it's there or whether it's how we're responding to the drought, Mr Speaker, and ensuring, as I've just answered the lead of the opposition and the programs we're delivering on the drought and providing that, that resource and that support where is it needed, and also the stability and certainty in our engagement with the countries of our region, our partners and those further afield and our greatest allies, Mr Speaker. And they have seen the stability and the certainty in the approach that we've been taking. And they've understood that Australia is a country that carries its own weight, but engage with its, with its partners to form new trade agreements which expand our opportunities, not just for Australia, but to underpin um, the prosperity of our region. And I was pleased to return from the inauguration of the President of Indonesia, where these very points will be able to be made, not just to the President, but those also in attendance, Mr Speaker. Stability in certainty the is Prime the mark Minister of our time government. time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the front page of every the major newspaper today. The Leader of the Opposition today. knows the rules on props. Yeah, and I'm just holding them up briefly, Mr. Speaker. The clock's ticking. Will the Prime Minister now rule out prosecuting ABC journalists Dan Oakes and Sam Clark and News Corp journalist Annika Smethurst for doing their jobs? Does the Prime Minister agree that journalism is not a crime? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree that journalism is not a crime, but I agree. Also, and I wonder if the Leader of the Opposition agrees, that if people, whatever profession they're in, whether they're politicians, whether they're um, journalists, whether they're anyone, Mr Speaker, public officials, there is no one in this country, Mr Speaker, who is above the law. People should not be prosecuted for their profession. They should only be prosecuted if indeed they have been found to be falling foul of the law, Mr Speaker. Members on my and left, the member for I Chifley. do not believe that those decisions about who should be prosecuted at the end of the day should be made on the whim of politicians. I think they should be made based on the rule of law, Mr Members Speaker. Members on my left. And the proper assessment of appropriately constituted law enforcement agencies. And that is why, Mr Speaker, Prime Minister, we have just provided pause for a second. The Prime Minister can just pause for a second. Those on my left are interjecting far too loudly. I need to be able to hear the Prime Minister. If they keep interjecting, I will take the required action. The Prime Minister has the call. So, Mr Speaker, the government believes absolutely in press freedoms in this country, and we have taken steps. We have taken the step to add additional defences into our laws to ensure that journalists, Mr Speaker, can get about their task. In fact, Mr Speaker, in protections that exceed that that apply to many others around the country. And those were put in by our government, not those opposite, because I remember when those were in government, the, they sought to gag the press in this country, Mr Speaker. They sought to gag the press in this country with their failed media reforms that wanted to implement a public interest test and a public interest media advocate to try and stifle the press Mr Speaker in this country. Now Mr Speaker, I'm not going to take lectures from a Labor Party who sought in this place when they are in government Member to try Isaacs and muzzle the press. In stark contrast, we have provided important guidelines from the Minister for Home Affairs to the uh, AFP and other law enforcement agencies about how they can best go about their business. 
and I note also the statements from the Commissioner of the AFP, Mr. Speaker, in the work that he is doing to review these matters. But I tell you what, Mr. Speaker, if it comes to a, a position in this country where prime ministers and politicians decide who gets prosecuted and who doesn't get prosecuted, Members Mr. Speaker, without taking the appropriate advice and without seeing the appropriate briefs, which are required under legislation. Where if we get to the point where the Leader of the Opposition wants to arbitrarily, arbitrarily, outside the law, decide who gets prosecuted and who doesn't, Mr Speaker, then that's not a country that I think Australians would want to live in. The member for Whitlam Shortlands uh, are warned. The member for Morton is also warned. The member for Mallee. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister inform the House how the Morrison-McCormack government is providing stability and certainty by investing in critical infrastructure, including through its $100 billion infrastructure pipeline? Is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I thank the member for Mallee for her question. Five years before Federation, uh, the Swan Hill Bridge was completed. and uh, This bridge is still operating today, although it needs repairs. And, uh, and when it does get those repairs, those much-needed repairs, there is interruption to the traffic and, of course, that uh, affects the community. But uh, we, as the uh, Liberals and Nationals, as part of our $100 billion uh, nationwide infrastructure rollout over the next decade. Well, we're getting on, and we're replacing that bridge. And uh, the local mayor, Anne Young, is absolutely delighted with what she's doing. And uh, the member for Mallee and I were there when uh, Councillor Young described replacing that Swan Hill Bridge as a budget winner. A budget winner indeed. And I'm sure the treasurer would have been delighted to hear those words. Uh, Councillor Young also said the federal government has already invested heavily in our region, and this bridge funding is the icing on the cake. The bridge has been a long-term aspiration of our community, and this funding will help us achieve a new bridge much sooner. And of course, she's right. There has been a lot of funding going into the member for Mallee's electorate because she's a fighter. She's determined, and she wants the best her community can be. And indeed, whether it's the member for Mallee, whether it's any electorate right across this country, they're all benefiting from having a budget towards surplus. They're all benefiting towards our delivery of infrastructure across this nation. We have committed funding to thousands of projects across the country, including up to 900 major projects, of which 280 are already completed and some 160 already under construction. That's delivery. And of course, we work with the states and territories to make sure that this funding becomes a reality. Now, in the uh, member for Mallee's electorate, we've committed $350 million through the Roads of Strategic Importance initiative now across six projects, and we will deliver this in full. We will deliver this in full. We've put funding on the table to make sure that these crucial, to make sure that these crucial freight enhancing projects Leader are the possible. And the member for Wright knows this because uh, in his portfolio area he hears every day how important these regional roads are, not just for road safety, but also for freight supply chains. Mr Speaker, in Tasmania we have commenced construction on the Murchison Highway corridor upgrade, with bridge strengthening along the corridor already complete. Uh, Labor would have never designed never designed an initiative such as the roads of strategic importance. They never would have. The member for Mallee asked me about, uh, about the opposition to this, and I'm looking at the opposition. It would never have happened. It would never have happened under Labor because they don't care about the regions, less do they care about infrastructure in the regions and those important roads, not necessarily national highways, but the byways which provide such vital leakage the points Deputy to our Prime rural Minister's communities. Time has Conclude. The member for Rankin. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. When the Reserve Bank, the IMF, the Business Council of Australia, AI Group, Master Builders, and others have all called for action by the government to support the economy, why is the government refusing to consider a proportionate, measured, and responsible stimulus program to boost the economy 
by bringing forward infrastructure investment. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's budget contains some almost $10 billion of infrastructure in this financial year, Mr. Speaker. That's money that is hitting right across the country. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, the tax cuts that were legislated by this government, um, fought against by the Labor Party, who said these shouldn't happen. And in fact, the Labor Party argued at the election that we should be imposing $387 billion of higher taxes, uh, higher taxes, Mr. Speaker, on the Australian economy. I don't know what sort of a stimulus package $387 billion of higher taxes constitutes, but that was the prescription that was off offered by the, by the shadow treasurer, Mr. Speaker, when he was the shadow finance minister and he was the joint architect. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with the former Shadow Treasurer and the former Leader of the Opposition, who said they thought at this time of great uncertainty in the global economy that adding $387 billion to the tax burden of Australians would be a good idea. Now, we don't share that view, Mr. Speaker. We believe and we have demonstrated in our budget that the right way to go about addressing uh, the issues in the global economy, indeed in the domestic economy, is the stable and considered approach of rolling out our program of reducing the cost of doing business, whether it's uh, on removing unnecessary regulation, uh, ensuring that we're training people for the skills needs of the future, delivering tax relief to Australians, in, 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 uh, taking further out Mr. Speaker, our trade barriers to ensure that we're dealing with more and more countries in the world taking our trade uh, agreements coverage from 26 per cent to 70 per cent, and we're seeking to go further, Mr Speaker. So that is the economic plan that we took to the election. The Labor Party would have us engage in the reckless spending policies that they last implemented when the member who asked the question sat at the knee of Wayne member Swan, Rankin. Mr Speaker, and instituted one of the most reckless, reckless spending packages which crashed the budget and took money away from things like pharmaceuticals, defence spending and a whole range of other important priorities because the Labor Party did not know how to manage money. Now he refers to the Governor Member of the Gordon. Reserve Bank, Mr Speaker, and I'm happy to quote him, Mr Speaker, where he has said the Australian economy, this is on the, the 1st of October appears to have reached a general turning point. The economy has been through a soft patch recently, but we are expecting a return to around trend growth over the next year. There are a number of factors that are supporting this outlook, he said. These include the low level of interest rates, the recent tax cuts, ongoing spending on infrastructure, signs of stabilisation in established housing markets. The so, Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister's I would time encourage has the members to reflect on those and I call the member for Warringah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Prime Minister. Food Bank is the largest provider of vital food and groceries to food relief charities around Australia. These charities provide relief to over 815,000 Australians each month, including people in Warringah and, importantly, farmers affected by the drought. 252 tonnes of food and groceries were shipped out of the Food Bank New South Wales warehouse last week alone. 110 tonnes went to regional and remote areas in New South Wales. Yet, Food Bank is not receiving any emergency funding to meet increased demand. Will the government increase funding to Food Bank and support a food security strategy as part of Australia's response to climate change? The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I thank the member for her question, and I, I will ask the minister representing the Minister for Social Services to um, respond further to the member's question. Um, the government actually does provide support to food bank. Um, we do to many food bank services around the country, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, we are pleased to do so because we acknowledge the tremendous work that they do. And uh, as we continue to work, particularly in, in response as a part of our drought program. Um, we are working with a whole host of different charitable organisations. We've provided over $50 million, in fact, to organisations like the Salvos and Vinnies and others, the Country Women's Association, in ensuring that we're providing the support where we can. But I'll ask the Minister, for Social Service, uh, the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services to add further. The Minister representing the Minister for Social Services. Uh, well, I do thank the member for her question and the Prime Minister for the opportunity to. Uh, 
add uh, some further information in relation to the support that the government provides for food banks, some $750,000 a year in funding over a four-and-a-half-year period. Uh, and that, of course, is not the only food relief uh, program that the uh, Commonwealth government, the Morrison government, supports. We also provide funding for two other uh, significant charities in this area, Second Bite and Oz Harvest. Uh, and these are all important measures uh, designed to provide support to needy Australians, to vulnerable Australians. And of course, uh, we continue to work with these important uh, agencies uh, for the delivery of this funding and continue to work with them and a whole range of other agencies to support Australians affected by drought. The member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on his recent attendance at the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF and the G20 Finance Ministers' meeting? Members will on the, my left. Will the Treasurer explain to the House how the Australian economy is performing compared to other G20 countries and the importance of our stable and certain approach on economic management? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policy approaches? The Treasurer has the call. I thank the member for McKellar for his question and note his extensive experience in business that he brings to this place and his commitment to strong economic management. Mr Speaker, the meeting of the IMF, G20 and World Bank uh, came at an important time for the global economy as we are going through a synchronised slowdown with the IMF downgrading the global forecast to 3 per cent for 2019. Mr. Speaker. The mood at the meeting uh, was serious but not panicked, Mr. Speaker, as countries the world over uh, are getting used to a world and economy with low interest rates, low inflation and relatively low unemployment. But the trade tensions between China and the US hang over the global economy like a dark cloud, Mr. Speaker. And the IMF has estimated that if they are unresolved, those tensions between China and the US, they could lead to McEwen. an up to 0.8 per cent reduction in global growth by 2020, Mr. Speaker. But certainly the comments from both the Americans and Chinese at this meeting were more positive than we've heard before. Now, Mr. Speaker, this meeting reinforced the need for Australia to continue to have considered, disciplined economic management, Mr. Speaker. Economic management that sees Australia in its 29th consecutive year of economic growth and with the first balanced budget in 11 years, Mr. Speaker. The first balanced budget in 11 years. And balanced budgets and surplus budgets help build the resilience of the Australian economy for external shocks whenever they may occur. But, Mr Speaker, I'm asked are there any alternative approaches? And we know that the Labor Party would take a sledgehammer to the Australian economy. We know they propose $387 billion of higher taxes, which would be hitting Australians from 1 July this year. Mr. Speaker. We know that they can't manage money because even when iron ore had a price that was more than double of what it is today, they still couldn't deliver a surplus budget, Mr. Speaker. We know that the unemployment Member rate was McEwen higher when warned. Labor was in and the participation rate was lower than it is today. And Mr. Speaker, we know we shouldn't expect anything different from those opposite. When the member for Sydney said she's mystified by the term aspiration, Mr. Speaker. When the member for Corio said that Labor took to the last election, handouts not hope, Mr. Speaker. When the member for Rankin says that retirees tax and a housing tax is something that he's proud and he's pleased of, Mr. Speaker. No wonder, no wonder former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating said the Labor Party today has lost the ability to speak to the aspirational Australians and to formulate policies to meet those aspirations. The member for Rankin. Uh, Speaker, I seek leave to table a transcript where the member who asked the Treasurer that question described the IMF as a left-wing organisation relying on left-wing groupthink. <laughs> the Leader of the House, leave is not granted. The member for Ballarat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why did the government spend nearly $17 million on taxpayer-funded congestion-busting advertising in the lead-up to this year's election, 
but did not spend a single cent from the Urban Congestion Fund the whole of the last financial year. <laughs> Members on my left, members on my the minister will just wait. The minister doesn't have the call. Members will cease interjecting or I'll start ejecting. The Leader of the Opposition, the it might be only Monday, but my patience is wearing thin. The minister has the call. Well, I thank the member for Ballarat for her question. Part of our $100 billion infrastructure pipeline is a $4 billion urban congestion fund. Now, this urban congestion fund provides key money to support and bust the congestion at local pinch points in the suburbs in our large capital cities. Because we know, Mr Speaker, it's not just the pace of the freeways which matters, but it's also getting through those congested intersections to get onto the major arterials. So we have targeted funding, 166 projects across our big capital cities, which we will be investing in. And as the member for Ballarat knows, we announced these 166 projects in the lead up to the federal election. The vast majority of the funding the kicked off on the 1st the of Ballarat. July of this particular year, and we have begun work with the states and territories on every single one of those projects. In fact, as the ba member for Ballarat may not be aware, we've already announced with the South Australian government the time schedule associated with each of the projects in South Australia. We've already announced with the Brisbane City Council the time the schedule and delivery schedule of all warned. of those projects. The minister in will just take a seat for a second. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of Thank order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It goes to relevance. It was a very clear question yes, the about of the spending money on ads. And... The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Members raising a point of order, as he well knows, simply should raise the point of order. It's not a time for to repeat the question or to summarise it. It's simply to raise the point of order. The Minister is in order. The Minister has the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. So we already have agreements with the, with the South Australian government. We've got agreements for some of the Queensland projects. And my expectation is that we'll soon have agreements in every single other jurisdiction where we have urban congestion fund projects underway, which will outline when these projects will start and when they will complete it. And I must say, Mr. Mr Speaker, that all of those discussions are going well, they're constructive. And the state governments share the state governments share our desire to get these projects underway as quickly as possible. In fact, even last night, the Jacinta Allen, the Victorian Transport Minister, she was quoted on Channel 9 as saying, "From our perspective, we are working as quickly as possible on these projects." So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it is just as we share our desire to get these done, as does the Transport Minister of Victoria, as does the Transport Minister in Queensland and so the other ministers right across the country. They will begin early next year in terms of the first ones, and then they will be rolling out, Mr Deputy Speaker, the busting congestion across the country. But of course, these things do take time. You do a public consultation. There's a design process. There's, you have this feasibility study. You have to go out and have competitive tenders. Now, the member for Ballarat might not understand this, but we do. We want to get them done. We'll follow due process. The member for Ballarat doesn't understand due process either in administering in government departments, as we know from last time. The member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Following his meeting with the G20 finance ministers, will the Treasurer outline to the House how the Morrison government's strong economic plan is providing stability and certainty to Australia, and is the Treasurer aware of any risks associated with alternative policies? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Ryan for his question and note his experience as a councillor with the Brisbane City Council and. Uh, his commitment to strong economic management, Mr Speaker. Now, when we came to government, unemployment was rising, investment was falling, and we know that the Australian economy 
was not uh, was not heading for a surplus budget as it is today, Mr. Speaker. Australia is now in its 29th consecutive year of economic growth. We have a AAA credit rating. We have the first current account surplus since 1975. Welfare dependency is at a 30-year low, Mr. Speaker, and we have seen nearly 1.5 million jobs being created since we came to government. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in the last jobs numbers, we saw in the last jobs numbers, Mr. Speaker, we saw that for each month for the last three years, for the first time ever, we have seen jobs growth, Mr. Speaker. We have a record number of Australians in work, a record number of women in work, Mr. Speaker, record participation rate, Mr. Speaker. In fact, employment growth is more than three times what we inherited from the Labor Party and more than double the OECD average, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue with our economic plan, an economic plan that's seen the most significant tax cuts in more than two decades, a $100 billion 10-year pipeline of infrastructure, more investment in apprenticeships and skills, Mr. Speaker, and more trade agreements. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm asked, are there any alternatives? Well, we know that the former member for Lilly and the mentor to the now member for Rankin said this. It's important that our political leaders work hard to build confidence in our economy and not be out there talking down the economy, Mr oh, Speaker. But that is what the Leader of the Opposition did last week. He compared the Australian economy to Greece, Mr Speaker. Shame on you! Shame on you, to the Leader of the Opposition! Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition used the language of the GFC, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will just resume his seat for a second. No, no. Just, just. I take it the Leader of the Opposition is um, seeking to take a point of order. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we can live with that. We'll call the Treasurer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party have shown themselves unable to deliver a budget surplus when they were last in government. And a budget surplus and a strong budget position is not about a bookkeeping exercise, as the BCA the has said, but rather warm. it restores confidence in the stewardship of the nation's finances and makes the country stronger. Right. That is what the peak business community of Australia has said. Now, Mr Speaker, we will continue to deliver strong jobs growth. We will continue to preside over an economy that is growing in its 29th year, and we will continue to lower taxes so that Australians can earn more and keep the more of what they earn. The time has concluded. The member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that none of the eight Victorian projects listed under the Roads of Strategic Importance Fund has even reached the planning stage? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her question, and I will ask uh, the Minister for Infrastructure to add to this answer. I was pleased on Friday to sit down with the Premier of Victoria and for the last several months I have been working closely with the uh, Premier of Victoria, as has uh, the Minister for Congestion Busting, but uh, more formally known, Mr Speaker, of Urban Infrastructure, and also the Minister for Infrastructure has been sitting down with all of our state and territory colleagues to ensure we have been able to both bring forward projects and ensure we get the timeline set and the agreements set. And this has also involved the provision of additional funds and invested, in particular, uh, in Victoria. Yes, and so I've been very pleased to be working closely with the Premier of Victoria and to be able to be making so much progress to ensure that both governments can be working together to deliver these projects in the years ahead. Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the opposition may want to engage in the theatre of politics on these matters, but the Premier of Victoria and I are engaging in the business of delivery of infrastructure projects in Victoria, and I'll invite the Minister for Infrastructure to add to my answer. 
The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Prime Minister for allowing me to add to his answer. And I thank the member for Jagger Jagger, and always happy to uh, have you come down and get a personal briefing from me about projects in your area. And, uh, and that goes for all, all of those in the opposition. Always, always happy, always happy to chat about uh, our $100 billion infrastructure pipeline and what we're doing individually in each and every one of your own electorates. Been plenty of takers. There have been plenty of takers, and I'm thankful that the member for Bendigo, she has taken the time and effort and trouble to come to me and uh, and ask about what's going on in her rural Victorian electorate. And uh, indeed, just last week, uh, Jacinda Allen, the Infrastructure and Roads Minister in Victoria, uh, talked uh, glowingly in Question Time about about the relationship that uh, the relationship for getting on with infrastructure projects in Victoria that's happening between the Commonwealth and the state government. And we will continue to make sure that uh, that we roll out infrastructure. And indeed. Uh, as far as urban congestion is going, uh, Mr. Speaker, 26 projects uh, in Victoria. This is excluding commuter car parks. The government has committed funding to 26 projects in that state, totalling $874.9 million. But in the member who asked the question, uh, she looks like she's too busy talking to uh, another member there. But in the member, the minister will resume his seat. You've completed your, completed your answer. None. Okay. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Goes to relevance. The question wasn't yes. about car parks, it was the, whether any of the, the eight leader projects of the will have even got to planning. The member for Wright, or Susan interjecting, the Deputy Prime Minister has said. We are getting on with planning, Mr Speaker. We are getting on with planning. We are working with the Victorian Government, Mr Speaker. Members on you my just left. can't build these things overnight. I know the uh, member opposite uh, thought he built the pyramids overnight, Mr Speaker, but in the members' electorate there is the M80 Ring Road upgrade, there is the North East Link, uh, South Eastern Roads and Northern Roads project. They are all the sorts of things that we are getting on with the to Deputy benefit Prime Jagger Jagger and to benefit Victoria. Concluded. I call the member for Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Uh, Minister, can you outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain approach to emissions reduction is helping to build our economy? And, Minister, are you aware of the risks associated with alternative approaches? The Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member Hang for Barker the, for his the question. The minister will just pause for a second. I haven't called you yet. I'm wondering why you're on your feet, but given your position, I'll I'll, I'll hear um, I'll hear with great interest what your point Thanks, of order Mr. is. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My my uh, point of order is under Standing Orders 100. D subsection 6. Mm. The question spoke about emissions reductions. Given that emissions are going up, is that the out of, of the order? Opposition will resume in that it's his an seat. ironic The leader, leader, I've asked you to resume your seat. The question's clearly in order. The leader of the opposition knows that. I can produce for him reams of Hamsard. All of my fascinating reading I do at night when the House isn't sitting, of times where he himself has rejected points of order at that stage when he was the leader of the House as being ridiculous. The Minister has the call. <laughs> well, the thank, you, thank call. you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Barker for his question, and I acknowledge his deep insight and advocacy for emissions-intensive businesses in regional areas because they are crucial to regional Australia. Now, Mr Speaker, when we arrived into government in 2013, we were faced with not just a financial deficit but a deficit in achieving emission reductions and abatement, Mr Speaker, because they left us, they left us with a 700 million tonne deficit versus our 2020 targets. Now, Mr Speaker, we now know from the hard work that's been done by this government and by hard-working Australian businesses and industry that will overachieve on that target by 367 million tonnes, Mr Speaker. That's a 1.1 billion tonne turnaround. We haven't just turned around their financial deficit, we have turned around their abatement deficit, Mr Speaker. And as we look forward to 2030, we've laid out to the last tonne how we're going to achieve uh, our 
emissions obligations through our three and a half billion dollar climate solutions package, Mr. Speaker. That's the centrepiece, and we'll do this while growing the economy, Mr. Speaker. So we have a clear policy that is delivering results. And Mr. Speaker, we're receiving endorsements for this policy from unusual quarters, from unusual places, Mr. Speaker. The member for Hunter has endorsed our policies. Mr. Speaker, the member for Burt has joined with him, but not just them, Mr. Speaker. The WA State Labor government has said that the government won the election and has a mandate to follow its policies through, Mr. Speaker. But just on the weekend, just on the weekend, the Australian Workers' Union, the, uh, of course, a, a place that's generated many of those opposite into this place, the Australian the Workers' Bruce. Union has endorsed our policies, Mr. Speaker. So, whilst we are in lockstep with the Australian people and hard-working Australian businesses right across this country, those opposite, those opposite are for Member hollow for symbolism and empty gestures, Mr. Speaker, because we don't yet know what their policies are but they have followed the Greens to support a climate emergency, Mr Speaker. Now, the question is, what do they mean by that? What do they mean by that? Well, the Greens have built the cat in the Senate, and they have defined a climate emergency. You know what it is? No oil, no gas, no coal, no Adani, no Beedaloo, and no hope for Australia under those policies, Mr Speaker. It means terminating literally tens of thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker. It seems that those opposite are taking a leaf out of Extinction Rebellion's playbook and are gluing themselves to their old mates in the Greens. Just um, before I call the member for Oxley, just on the, I think this is important information for um, members of the House following the leader of the opposition's last attempted point of order. I'm just going to make it very clear to the House, just so members understand. Uh, it's been the practice of speakers for many decades now to be very liberal uh, when it comes to the practice of interpreting the standing orders with questions. Just so members are clear, the rules for questions, as the Leader of the Opposition outlined in Standing Order 100, uh, include um, Questions must not contain, um, well, first of all, 100A, questions must not be debated. They also must not contain arguments, inferences, imputations, insults, ironical expressions, or hypothetical matter. So, if the opposition want me to enforce that, I think they'll be finding it very difficult to ask any questions at all. I'll just make that point. The member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that for every $100 of the Roads of Strategic Importance Fund, only 50 cents will be spent in Queensland this year? The Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, well, we are getting on with funding, funding Roads of Strategic Importance for and projects warned. in Queensland. And, and, and I have asked Mark Bailey, the minister responsible, to bring forward projects. We're getting on with making sure that uh, we build the roads, build the ports, and do everything that uh, we need to do as a government to build a better Queensland. We're getting on with the job of making sure that if it comes to Queensland or indeed any state or territory, that we're building roads of strategic importance. Those opposite wouldn't ever have funded a program such as the Roads of Strategic Importance because they never ever worried about a regional program unless they could rot it. Unless they could rot it. And speaking of the Chief Deputy Rotter, here she is. Deputy Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for Ballarat. I do have a point of order, but I would also last like to ask the Minister to withdraw that imputation that he just made then. Mm. The Deputy Prime Minister, the member for Ballarat. Thank you. The question was very uh, no, tight. No, you need to state what the Sorry, point of order is. The question was very tightly worded. It was about asking the minister to confirm the, on the roads to a sister and it's important that only 50 per cent. Member for Ballarat has, has already been warned. She does not have the call. The Deputy Prime Minister is in order. The Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, of the 26 announced rosy corridors, Mr Speaker, nine have had specific projects announced. 
Eight have already undergone significant planning work and local consultation, and that is important. When you build a road, you have to uh, conduct in uh, local consultation. Uh, have been already been undertaking, including Toowoomba to Seaboard Corridor through the Newell Highway Strategy, Barton Highway, uh, Caratha to Tom Price. Appreciating that not all of these are in Queensland, uh, Member for Oxley, uh, but it's important. It's important to note. And, and let me tell you, when the Liberals and Nationals are in government, we fund 80 per cent of regional road projects, whereas when those uh, opposite are in government, and thankfully that hasn't been too often in recent years, it's only, it's only 50 per cent. We fund it's an 80-20 split with states or territories. Those opposite, generally speaking, invariably, it is just a 50-50 per cent. So that's a significant saving for those states in those areas where we're funding where we're funding road programs. And, uh, we talk about the uh, Wheatbelt Secondary Freight Network Corridor in, uh, in uh, Western Australia. We are providing funding, whether it's Queensland, whether it's, whether it's any state, providing those vital linkage points. And when it came to the Toowoomba Second Range Crossing, a project that started under our government and finished under our government, Sure, it's not, but it's certainly, it's certainly making sure that if you're a truck driver, and they full well understand, I don't know whether you've been in a truck lately, but they can now yeah, drive to west to Toowoomba to 140 to the Minister, He needs, needs to confine himself to the subject matter of the question. Well, it is a road. It is strategically important, Mr Speaker, mm -hmm. and a truck driver can drive 140 kilometres west of Toowoomba and arrive at the Port of Brisbane without a set of traffic lights. That's delivery. That's what the Liberals and Nationals do. And when it comes to roads of strategic importance, when it comes to black spot funding, when it comes to Great Northern Roads, when it comes to the Beef Roads program, we're getting on building it. Those opposite, when they had six years of opportunity to do it, well, they just talked about it. The member for McEwen has been warned. He's continued to interject, unfortunately, so he can go and interject at the television in his office and leave under Standing Order 94A. And I've got a, quite a list of uh, people who've been warned. So, the member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations. Will the Attorney outline to the House why it is important for the Morrison government to provide a stable and certain approach to considering changes in industrial relations, which would make life better for businesses and workers in key sectors of the Australian economy? And is the attorney aware of any alternative approaches? The attorney general and leader of the house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. I mean, the member um, is aware, as, as I am and as the prime minister is, that amongst the many contentious issues inside the industrial relations system, the system itself is actually full of a range of practical problems that are looking for practical solutions. And as the member is aware, I mean, industrial relations plays this critically important and central role to contributing to the strength of the Australian economy. Uh, as the member is also aware, uh, the Morrison government has undertaken to clearly identify ways in which we can increase productivity, make the IR system more efficient and fairer for both employers and employees, the idea being that we need to find ways where there is a, a, a consensus that can be built around policy changes that will put upward pressure on wages, that will make businesses stronger, help them to employ more people. And, in discussing just one of those potential areas for improvement, I might use some words that were spoken um, by the former Leader of the Opposition before the last election, when the member for Maribyrnong said this. He said, we want to look at, this is Labor, we want to look at the ability for companies to negotiate with unions for extended greenfields agreement, project life, so you can go to the global investors who will back it. That is a very, very good idea. And enterprise agreements are a critical part of the system. They allow flexibility and they are particularly important in the mining and resources sector, particularly in Western Australia and Queensland. In the last uh, parliament, there was a decline in EAs because of the fact that many of them were being invalidated by minor technical issues. Literally, it was the case that enterprise agreements were being invalidated if they had a mistaken document stapled to the back of them on submission. And this was causing immense problems, inefficiency, waste, cost for business. In the last parliament, we brought in legislation so that it was the case. Indeed, and, indeed, and I Jordan. congratulate you for, for supporting it. This is about finding other things that we can do together to make the system more efficient. 
That has definitely worked to make the system more efficient. Uh, the, the number of days that it was taking to conclude an enterprise agreement has dropped from 76 in the last seven months to 34. That saves business money, that helps business become more efficient. But when we have these big projects, if it is the case, as we have suggested in a recent discussion paper, that we can find some consensus around how to have enterprise agreements for the life of those projects, and these are projects like Woodside's Burrup Hub, natural gas project, that will create on average every year for decades 4,000 jobs a year. Now, these are the projects that we think are more likely to get across the line from banking feasibility stage to reality if we can provide them with the ability to negotiate an enterprise agreement for the life of the projects. This is one of two discussion papers, the other being about how to properly define wage theft, and we look the very much forward to Minister's talking about these with the opposition. Concluded. I call the member for Canberra. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Since coming to office, the government has spent a total of $5 billion less on infrastructure than it promised, including $123 million less than it promised on black spots. Why? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, as members opposite would know, the program and schedule of projects which the government pursues is one that is put together in partnership with the states and territories as we seek to implement that plan. And Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and indeed whether it's with local government even on projects that we pursue, our job is to ensure that we provide the allocation of the funds and to set the priority projects and to sit down with the state and territory governments. Now, those opposite would know, and in particular the Leader of the Opposition would know from his time when he served as a, as a Minister for Infrastructure that the scheduling, of projects, the scheduling of projects is set out together with the states and territories, and the profile for the delivery of those projects is often revised based on the advice which is provided by those states and territories. And that is why, that is why the, uh, the changes in the schedule uh, arrive as they have. Now, I'd make this point, though, Mr Speaker. Under our government this year, we will spend around $10 billion on infrastructure. That is what is budgeted to be spent in this very financial year all around the country. Now, Mr Speaker, that's almost double, almost double what we inherited from the Labor Party when we came to government. And the Leader of the Opposition, who sits at the table now, I think from memory, and I'd be happy to stand corrected on this figure, Mr Speaker, but I understand the figure at that time was around $6 billion. And so this this year, we're spending $10 billion or thereabouts, just slightly less than that. And the reason we're doing that is because two budgets ago we decided to put in place the $75 billion pipeline of projects over 10 years. And in the last budget, recognising recognising the difficult situation that we're facing in the global economy, we increased that pipeline of investments over the next 10 years. $100 billion. We upped it, Mr Speaker, because we knew that's what the Australian economy would need, just not now, but over the next 10 years. And more importantly than that, we have the budget discipline and the budget to back those sorts of commitments up. So, Mr Speaker, the reason for any change in schedules is not because of the lack of fiscal capacity or discipline because of this government but because of any changes to scheduling that is done in relation to our negotiations with the states and territories. What well, I know from those opposite when they're in government, the reason they cut defence spending, the reason they don't list pharmaceuticals, the reason they have to strike flood levies and all of these things is because they never know how to manage money. And that's why at the last election Australians knew they could trust this government to deliver because they know they can trust us to manage money. The member for Herbert. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the Minister outline to the House why it is important for the Morrison government to provide a stable and certain approach to our defence industry, and how does this approach differ from alternative policies? The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, may I thank the member for Herbert for his question and thank him for his service to the country and also note his passion for defence industry as well in this country. 
Mr. Speaker, the Morrison government has a strong record of identifying and investing and delivering in what makes and keeps Australians safe at home and abroad. And that's why it's important to provide certainty to our defence industry to create jobs and to create those defence industry opportunities and at the same time keep Australians safe, Mr Speaker. Because of our government's strong economic management, we're very proud that we are now restoring defence spending to 2 per cent of GDP, reversing the significant decline that the nation experienced under Labor. We will achieve the 2 per cent of GDP in the 2021 period, Mr Speaker, which is three years before being predicted. Um, and of course, this is due to our good economic management of those sitting on this side. Now, Mr. Speaker, I've been asked about alternative policies. And under Labor, defence was an unacceptable casualty of the inability of those opposite to manage money. And in six years, Labor did not commission a single Australian built ship, Mr Speaker. Now what, what I do know, Mr Speaker, is that there are many new members on this side of the House and on the other side of the House, and, and they may have thought that they misheard me, Mr Speaker. So I think it's worth repeating that. That in six years Labor did not commission a single Australian built ship. So by contrast, the Morrison government will, will build 57 vessels in Australia built in Australia by 15,000 Australian workers using Australian steel. In 2012-13, Labor slashed the defence budget by over 10 per cent in real terms, Mr. Speaker, causing defence investment to fall to its lowest level since World War II. And it's because of Labor's panic and crisis, Mr. Speaker, that Labor was able to cut $18 billion from the defence budget whilst they were in government. Labor's cuts cause Australian defence industry to cut thousands of Australian jobs and at the same time place our defence capability at risk. Mr Speaker, what we do know is that Labor Gordon. pays lip service to defence. When they run out of money, they use Defence Department as their Member personal Gordon ATM. That much ruled. we do know. But Mr Speaker, it is the Morrison government that is providing the security that our defence forces and our defence industry need. We on this side were investing $200 billion in our defence industries. We're creating more Australian jobs. We're giving more and more opportunities. The more Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. You are very rude, Leader of the Opposition. And at the same time, we're keeping our Australians safe. The member for Bruce. His interjections are awful, so he can leave under 94A as well. No point. I mean, I, I like to discount for humour, but in his case, it doesn't apply. Um, I'm just going to say to the um, leader of the opposition and others: um, when, when ministers are answering the questions, they should they should not rise and, until um, uh, they've either completed their answer or I've called them because the clock has run down. I'm just the minister for home affairs and the member for Isaacs. I might let you continue your conversation elsewhere if it continues. I'm just going to say it might only be Monday, but I might start to acquaint um, members with the practice of the New Zealand speaker who feels willful uh, uh, flouting of the standing orders results in uh, a question being taken away, something I'll ponder on through the week. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Infrastructure. Uh, can he confirm that the gap between what the government promised on budget nights and what they've actually spent on infrastructure is on black spots, 123 million; heavy vehicle safety program, 134 million; bridges renewal, 154; cattle supply, 96; Northern Australia roads, 266 million. Western Sydney infrastructure 915 million, major road projects 2.8 billion, and, and asset the recycling initiative 1.5 billion. Concluded. The deputy prime minister has the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm happy to provide an update to the uh, to the uh, opposition leader about all of those projects. But uh, 
uh, rest assured, Mr. Speaker, we're getting on with the job of building a better future, building a better Australia. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to uh, providing, providing funding for projects, there are many, many members who are delighted as to getting the infrastructure that they, their electorates need. And certainly when it comes to uh, regional programs, uh, the black spots funding, the tripling of the roads to recovery and those sorts of funding which, which is provided to local councils where they can make the decisions at a local level. And that is so important. And that is the difference perhaps between the Liberals and the Nationals and what we saw under six years under the Rudd Gillard Rudd years. When the member who asked me the question, the opposition leader, the member for Graindler, uh, was the <coughs> infrastructure minister. And I know he would have been absolutely thrilled to have the sort of infrastructure spend that we are investing uh, on this side of the House uh, since we've been in government in 2013. And not only, not only are we providing uh, that infrastructure spend, but the rubber is actually hitting the road. We are getting on with the job. And if there is one thing, if there is one thing that those opposite could do, uh, where, there are, where there are projects and programs that they feel are necessary, they could pick the phone up, particularly to their Labor infrastructure ministers at a state level, and ask what are they also doing to work in conjunction with the Commonwealth to make sure that we get these programs and projects delivered. And that would be a great start. We, we have had a good support, and I, and I have to say, whether it's Mark Bailey in Queensland and Jacinda Allen in Victoria, two Labor ministers prepared to come to the table. I know the Prime Minister met with uh, Premier Daniel Andrews just last Friday. We want to build infrastructure. We need to build infrastructure. Indeed, we're getting on with the job of building infrastructure. And the Australian government is spending, as I say, $100 billion, $100 billion over a 10-year pipeline of investment. And the 2019-20 the budget included $23 billion of new commitments, including $2.6 uh, for Queensland, uh, $6.1 for New South Wales, more than six in Victoria, uh, $933 million in uh, Western Australia, $1.8 billion in South Australia, $68 million uh, in Tasmania, $60 million in the Northern Territory and $50 million in the Australian Capital Territory. That's investment. That's delivery. That's the future. That's building our better, a better future for Australians. That's the Liberals and Nationals' way. The member for Nichols. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Water Resources, Drought rural finances, natural disaster and emergency management. Will the minister update the House on the impact of the drought across regional Australia and how is the Morrison government assisting those people and the communities that are affected? The Minister for Water Resources. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Nichols for his question. He's understanding that this drought has spread like a cancer. First up in my part of the world, my electorate, some seven years ago, in the Northern Territory, now into New South Wales and Victoria, and even into Tasmania and across into South Australia. But our response has been ongoing. This isn't new, this has been ongoing. We continue to support. And tackling drought is like going up a set of stairs. Every time it escalates, you take another step. And that's what this government does in response to this drought. And we've made sure that we've brought all the stakeholders with it, particularly after the National Drought Summit, in making sure that the commitment from the states and the Commonwealth was agreed. And we continue to have that unanimous and bipartisan approach to it. The states look after animal welfare, freight and fodder. We look after farmer welfare. And our response has been predicated on three pillars, three core pillars. First pillar on the here and now, giving the dignity and respect that our farmers deserve in giving them farm household allowance. Over $120,000 in farm support, in money in their pocket to give them the dignity to be able to have household expenses paid for them, while creating an environment around them with rural financial counsellors to be able to help them make decisive decisions about their future, strategic decisions about their future, and also giving them the ability to access low-interest loans, saving them tens of thousands of dollars putting money back into their pocket. The second pillar is about the community. Understanding that this drought goes beyond the farm gate. It goes into the local economies. So we've empowered local councils to have local solutions, not Canberra solutions, about how we stimulate these local economies. Getting projects that use local tradies, using local materials from the local hardware store, but also understanding the mental impacts and making sure there are targeted mental, mental welfare programs put into these communities. But for the first time, we're thinking about the future. We're thinking about preparing for the next drought, taking the next step in terms of drought policy. And that's been done in the past through concessions, over $500 million a year in tax concessions to farmers to help them prepare in the good years, putting away them, for their money through farm management deposits, being able to now to offset that against their term debts. 
and also around building the infrastructure that stores the fodder to build the resilience. But it's also around the future fund, making sure there's a dividend to give them the tools, equip them with the tools to prepare for the next drought through research and development, extension work, so they understand what is available for them, the tools they need, and the new science and cutting technology to be prepared for the next one. And the third, third part of the third pillar is around the infrastructure, providing them with the water infrastructure to build resilience and to have a longer lag period between droughts, harvesting the water when it comes to give them a, a red-hot crack at getting through the next drought. Our job as a federal government is to put the environment and infrastructure around them. That's what our three pillar policy is about. Standing with them shoulder and shoulder and saying it will rain and when it does rain, we will be there to protect them in the bad and the good years. The member for Lingiari. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister how does the government expect to unlock the full potential of Kakadu National Park when it's pushed back the start date for upgrades of roads in Kakadu National Park to beyond the next election? The Minister for the Environment. Well, I thank the member for his question, and I find it quite extraordinary that he should be suggesting that $216 million committed by the Prime Minister in this side of politics for the upgrade in Kakadu National Park is somehow insufficient. Now we all know what happens. Members on my left. We all know what happens when you roll out an infrastructure program too quickly because we saw it with Labor in government time after time. We know what happens when you shovel that money out the door, no policy, no guidelines, no procurement. $216 million has been dedicated to the upgrade of Kakadu. I was there recently. The traditional owners are very happy with the process. The tourism initiatives that are starting, they're very happy with the process. We've got good relationships with the Northern Territory government. We're not playing politics about this. How could you come into this place and talk this sort of nonsense? Honestly, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the member minister will just resume their seat. Has the minister concluded her answer? The minister's concluded her answer. I call the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's stable and certain economic management enables life-saving medicines to be available on the PBS, including medicines which help improve the lives of children suffering from cystic fibrosis? Is the Minister aware of any alternatives to this approach? The Minister for Health has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member for Boothby, uh, who, uh, amongst many causes, has been a great voice for uh, women uh, with endometriosis, along uh, with the uh, member for Forest and the former member for uh, Canberra, Gay Brockman. And, uh, in addition to her advocacy on that front, uh, prior to coming to this place, she uh, worked with the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and understood, through her work there, and advocated for the importance of a stable, balanced approach to the economy. One of the reasons why, of course, is uh, she witnessed in 2011 when the then government was unable to fund critical medicines for conditions just such as endometriosis and treatment of IVF. Fortunately, however, we are in a very different place today, a place where over 2,200 new or amended medicines have been listed under this government, including on the weekend the announcement that new medicines for cystic fibrosis would be listed. In particular, Orcambi will now be extended to children between the ages of two and five, beautiful young ch children, and for the first time, Simdeco will be made available for children from 12 years up and adults. And why is this important? These new medicines are life-extending, life-improving, life-saving, and would otherwise cost $250,000 a year. So they would be beyond the reach of virtually every Australian family. And it's expected that uh, these medicines, which will be available on the PBS from the 1st of December, will help over 1,400 patients. And instead of $250,000, they'll now be available for $6.50 or $40.30. Significantly, we've managed to negotiate immediate compassionate access for free from today. And that's immensely important for these young people, immensely important for children such as Xavier, 
five years old that I met yesterday. And last night, I received an email from Dr Sonia Marshall. To the best of my knowledge, I've not previously met Sonia. And what she said was, uh, D. Greg, Member what fantastic MacArthur. news you delivered this morning about Simdeco and or Canby. There are lots of tears of joy in our house this morning. There are no words adequate enough to thank the Australian government for the role they are playing in changing for the future for those with cystic fibrosis. My almost 14-year-old daughter has been taking or can be for 13 months. It has completely changed her life, changed our lives beyond recognition. Before or can be, Evie would spend 13 hours a day doing CF treatments. After or can be, it takes only 45 minutes a day. And that is why a strong budget matters, and that is why a strong heart matters, and why a strong PBS the is essential. Minister's time has concluded. The Prime Minister. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. And, Mr. Speaker, if I could add to an answer yes, uh, in relation proceed. to the question from the member for Lingiari on the 13th of September of this year, I can confirm that the tender was awarded to Australian company Oricon, an engineering design advisory company that will lead preparation of the Kakadu Road strategy, which will guide investment of the $70 million roads package, and they'll work in a consortium with PwC, Pavement Management Services and PwC Indigenous Consulting, uh, beginning the work immediately. The roads strategy will be developed in consultation alongside the Tourism Master Plan with a view to improving road safety, visitor access to key sites and ensuring that the investment in roads and access complements planned upgrades to visitor infrastructure across Kakadu. I thought the member would be interested in that additional information.